Today's story will reflect on the single deadliest event in New York City's history prior to September 11, 2001. So obviously, viewer discretion is advised. But before we get into that story, if you like learning about New York City's history through storytelling format, then you've come to the right place because that's all I do. Uh, please make sure that you subscribe to the channel and click the notification bell. That way you can be informed every time that I upload. Also, please like the video, leave a comment, share the video. I want to share this with as many people as possible. That way more people can learn about the wild stories that are attached to my city. And without further ado, let's get into today's story. St. Mark's Evangelical Lutheran Church stands in a part of Manhattan today that we call the East Village. If you were to go back to the late 19th century, though, this part of Manhattan was often referred to as Klein Deutschland, referencing the nearly 50,000 German immigrants that lived in the neighborhood. St. Mark's was a staple of Klein Deutschland. And when the school year was over, something that St. Mark's liked to do was rent a boat and they would take all of these German families and they would go up the East River and go out along the northern coast of Long Island, about 50 miles away from the church, there was this picnicking area. So they would spend the day there and then they'd bring all the families back. This tradition began back in 1887 and it would continue for the next 17 years. So in 1904, they started their preparation the same exact way that they always had, which was an inspection of the boat that would be taking them on the picnic. The boat that was taking them in 1904 was the General Slocum. The General Slocum was a side wheeler steamboat. Now these kinds of boats have two large wheels on opposite sides of the craft that will spin paddles in order to propel the boat forward. But these kinds of boats are not meant for far distances. They're more so meant for leisurely travel to places like beaches or parks. In the General Slocum's history, it had run aground three times. It had collided with two ships. It had struck a sandbar. It had survived a riot from drunk anarchists. All within a 13-year span. In other words... This was a boat that probably shouldn't have been on the water. But the captain of the General Slocum was a man named William Van Schaik. People had been calling for his retirement for quite some time, but the steamboat company had turned the other cheek on this because he had very good relationships with inspectors. This is kind of why the General Slocum was still on the water. In May of 1904, the Steamboat Inspection Service would take a look at the General Slocum. In fact, they made notes that the 13-year-old life belts were of good quality, that they were up to date. They took a look at the lifeboats. However, what the inspectors failed to report on was that the six lifeboats on board the General Slocum were actually stuck to the boat by a thick coat of paint. They had also failed to report on whether or not fire hoses or fire pumps were functional. In other words, in case of fire emergency, the crew would not be able to free the lifeboats and they had no idea if the fire hoses or pumps could work. These are all things that the crew could have figured out and could have avoided had they conducted a fire drill prior to the departure date. But of course, they didn't. On June 15th, 1904, so about a month after the inspection, you had about 1,300 people that would board the General Slocum along the East River on its 3rd Street dock, which doesn't exist anymore. Most of the people getting on board the boat were women and children, as this trip was happening on a Wednesday. So being that it was during the middle of the week, most of the men would be at work. Now, even though this event was taking place during the middle of the week, it was still tradition to wear your Sunday best for this trip. So people were dressed in their suits and their dresses. There was also this nice slight breeze going through the air. You also had the sun in the sky at 74 degrees Fahrenheit. There's no rain in the forecast. By all means, this is a perfect 
day for a picnic. If you were unable to attend the picnic, odds are you were probably waving goodbye to your family along the shore. So people were gathered all up along the Manhattan coast of the East River, and they would be waving goodbye to their loved ones. And of course, there'd be music going on as the church had their church band playing music on the upper deck. So people are even dancing along the decks. So this seems like a really good time. And again, this is a tradition that has been going on for 17 years. These people are used to things going a very specific way. Once the boat finally set sail, the passengers would wave for a couple miles or so before eventually the crowd started to dim down. So if you were looking on the left side of the boat, you would have looked out at Manhattan and seen brownstones and factories and slaughterhouses. If you were on the right side of the boat, you would have seen Blackwell Island, which today we call Roosevelt Island. Not nearly as inhabited, although you would have seen some hospitals out that way. You would have seen uh, an asylum. You would have seen a lighthouse, too, on the northern end of Blackwell Island. Once you clear Blackwell Island, there's a stretch of the East River where the water was relatively calm. However, once you get towards the northern end of Queens, that's when the Harlem River and the East River are going to converge on one another. And this creates some turbulent waters, and people for the longest time have called this area Hellgate. This area has sunk hundreds of vessels dating back to the 1600s. Now, as the ship approached this area in the river, there was a child who was standing up on the main deck. And for whatever reason, he turned around and looked to the back of the ship. And what he saw was smoke coming out of the lamp room right below the main deck. The lamp room was filled with straw, with lamp oil, with oily rags. So this was obviously a huge problem. He wanted to make sure that this was supposed to be happening, but no one else seemed to be noticing it. So this child would search around for crew members, and when he finally was able to find some, he would let them know what he saw, and they immediately sprung into action. However, none of these crew members knew exactly what they were supposed to be doing because they had never run a fire drill before. So they were completely in the dark with what to do here. These crew members would attempt to stomp out the fire and even throw charcoal on it, trying to contain the fire. Then they were discussing, you know, how did this even start? The best guess that they had was a discarded cigarette or a lit match. No one had any clue how this fire had even begun. But they were convinced that the fire was now contained and they figured, let's go and try to figure out what to do next. When the crew left to go get help, they would leave the door open to the lamp room. And even though this wasn't exactly a windy day, they were approaching the windiest part of the river, which was Hellgate, where all of these different rivers converge on one another. And by leaving the door open, that wind would sweep through the room and that fire would immediately grow. Meanwhile, Captain Van Schaik is oblivious to all of this. He's simply steering the ship, assuming that everything is fine. A child at some point would barge into the room and tell him, hey, we need to get to land because this boat is on fire. But the captain is thinking to himself, if this boat was on fire, my crew would be coming in here to let me know, not some child. However, because they had never conducted a fire drill before, every member of the crew is trying to put out this fire or has already given up and has jumped into the East River trying to save themselves. Now the crew's still on board. They're putting in their best efforts into fighting the flames by using the fire hose. When they turned on the hose, this big jet stream of water comes out, but it only lasted for a few seconds. It turns out that the hose was so rotten that it would in fact burst open and become useless to the crew. Now luckily there was a second hose and when they tried again, well guess what happened? The same exact thing. At this point, the crew had completely given up. Smoke was beginning to fill the cabins and the passengers and all 1300 of these passengers began to panic. This is when the band stops playing. They're looking around them and realizing what the danger levels are. They have no idea what's happening. They just know that the ship is on fire and it doesn't look like they're going to be able to put it out. 
what are we supposed to do? Now, something to keep in mind right now, this boat is very slow moving. It has traveled for several miles up the East River at this point, and odds are, even if you were on the boat with some family, there's a good chance that you are completely separate from one another here, exploring different parts of the boat. And when this stampede of people breaks out, it becomes impossible for families to link back up with one another. In fact, people who had been with each other already. You have mothers that are grabbing onto their children's hands and stampedes of people running right through those handholds. And some of these families would be torn apart for good. They'd never find each other again after this. There were people in the lower decks who were trapped. They'd be huddled up in corners as flames would get closer and closer until eventually the people burned to death. Other people inhaled so much smoke that they would just pass out and eventually get trampled over during this mass hysteria. Then there were people on the upper decks who were trying to free the lifeboats, but as it turns out, those lifeboats weren't just painted over and stuck to the wall. They were actually fixed to the wall with wire. So these lifeboats were completely useless. They were only there for show. Now, one man noticed that there were life preservers actually stored above the lifeboats. They were contained by even more wire. So what they did was they put children up on the adult's shoulders, and then they would try to wrestle these life preservers out of this wire. The children would get their fingers cut badly, and then they would put on the life preservers, and they would jump overboard. However, it turns out that this was yet another screw-up by the inspectors. And here's how. First off, the reality was most of the people on this boat didn't know how to swim. These life jackets were their last hope. And unfortunately, it had all been filled with cork, which is fine because cork is supposed to float, but all of the cork was rotten. So it had all lost its buoyancy. So when you put it in the water, rather than float on it, it absorbed the water. Meaning that if you were wearing a life preserver and you jumped into the water, you would now have extra weight on you instead of a device helping you to float. So in other words, if you didn't know how to swim, you actually still had a better chance of survival if you jumped into the water without a life preserver because you didn't have that extra weight on you. There were plenty of people who had wrapped these life preservers around their children and then just tossed them over the railing, hoping that they would eventually be able to float and they'd be able to find them and swim their way to shore. But once they threw them overboard, the kids never came back up. At this point in the trip, Captain Van Schaik is fully aware of what is happening. He increases the speed of the boat because he is trying to get it to a shoreline, whatever the closest one might be. Except... He didn't take them to the closest shoreline. The closest shoreline would have been in the Bronx. But for whatever reason, and no one knows why he did this, Captain Van Schaik decided to continue forward and eventually would crash land on the shore of North Brother Island, which is just west of Rikers Island. Now, there were doctors and nurses on North Brother Island who had already seen the boat on fire in the East River. And as it got closer and closer, they realized that they were going to be helping very, very soon. When the boat eventually did land on North Brother Island, there were even smallpox patients who were helping to retrieve people from the water. There were also tugboat captains who were nearby who were able to help retrieve some people from the water. There were people along every single shoreline of every borough who were willing to help anyone who could get close enough to the coast. Even two prisoners from Rikers Island helped to fetch people out of the water. Now, there were some passengers who actually could swim and did whatever they could to save as many different people as possible. But that's the passengers. As for the crew, which includes the captain, all of these people did nothing to help the passengers. They were only interested in saving themselves. In fact, the steamship company had sent a boat out to retrieve not passengers, but any crew members that they could find because they wanted to coach them up as to how to talk to the media and to the police about what had happened out on the East River. 
One of the victims was the band leader who was found with a shoe print on his forehead, which indicated that he had, in fact, been trampled to death. Among the survivors was the pastor of St. Luke's Evangelical Lutheran Church. However, he was mourning his wife who had died in the General Slocum disaster, along with hundreds of of his own parishioners, people that he had baptized, people that he had married, or people that he had simply seen every single Sunday. As for the General Slocum itself, tugboats would drag that out further into the water and allow it to sink into the river. In an age without cell phones, this was a terrifying ordeal for the people at home, too. They knew that the boat had caught fire and knew that a bunch of people had died, but they didn't know if their wife or their children had died or... Uh, if they were still alive. You had a couple options as to what you could do, but it wasn't really that easy. You could travel to a bunch of different hospitals and go room by room and see if you saw any of your loved ones, or you could wait at the church and you could hope that you'd find answers there. The pastor's son got stuck fielding questions at the church, even though he had no more information than anyone else there on the ground. In fact, he'd be worrying about his own family that was on board the boat that day. Bellevue Hospital would create a makeshift morgue behind their building. 10,000 people would walk body by body searching for their loved ones. Now, in some cases, the only way to identify a loved one might have been a valuable around their neck, whether it was a necklace or a pair of earrings, something like that, because these bodies had been so badly disfigured, burned, charred even. And unfortunately, some of the people who were walking by this makeshift morgue were only interested in stealing those valuables. So some of these families, the victims were never claimed. The final death toll was 1,021 people, with an overwhelming majority of those people being German immigrants. A lot of the German people who lived in this particular part of New York City would move away to try to distance themselves from this tragedy, and this is where we started to see the end of Klein Deutschland. Investigations were launched into the inspectors as well as the steamship company. However, the only person who was ever charged with a crime was Captain William Van Schaik. He was sentenced to 10 years in prison. However, he would be pardoned after eight years in prison. As for St. Luke's, St. Luke's would close in 1940, and they would sell the building to become a Jewish synagogue, which it remains to this day. Maybe one of the most unlikely survivors was a six-month-old girl named Adela Libanow. Her family all died in the wreckage. However, she somehow survived. When she was two and a half years old, Adela was brought to Tompkins Square Park so that she could tug the cloth off of the General Slocum Memorial Fountain, which still stands in Tompkins Square Park today. Adela would live to be 100 years old. She died in 2004. Her stance on why the tragedy is not well known today was simple. The Titanic had a great number of famous people on it. This was just a family picnic. So that's going to do it. Remember, I'm Mike, the NYC Storyteller. If you liked today's video, please click the thumbs up below. Make sure to leave a comment. Make sure to tell your friends about it. Share it with your relatives. Uh, I don't know, subscribe to the channel. Click the notification bell. That way you can be informed each and every time I upload. And... I really got to figure out how to end these videos.